What's up, guys? Welcome to Unprofessional. I'm your host, Trevor Greenbaum. In this one, I talk with Heather Hutchinson. She was blind since birth. Well, she's still blind, but she was blind since birth as well. And we have a pretty good discussion. I think it's relatable to everybody, even though, uh, you know, she's been through so much. Uh, We talk about her being in the psych ward, her uh, going through life blind and how that can apply to you. And we have a pretty good discussion. I think there's a lot to learn there. So without further ado, here is me and Heather. So one of the reasons I work hard every day, guys, is so I can be among great people um, that the world has to offer. And today I'm happy to be talking to someone who has definitely seen great adversity and has had the courage to fight through it and come out the other side. Um, it's a trait I always admire and uh, it kind of keeps me going every day, honestly. Um, so I'm happy to be talking to today, award-winning singer and Amazon best-selling author, Heather Hutchinson. So thanks for coming on, Heather. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah. An important thing, there's important things to know about you. And I, while it's not, it's not someone's deficits that define them, it's how you like act in the face of the deficits, but it's important to like know what those deficits are because it's an important part of everybody's story, right? Mm-hmm. And you have been blind since birth, yes. right? Um, and it's impossible to ask you, you know, I was, before that I was thinking, how do I ask her questions about being, being blind and growing up like that? Because you, you don't have the experience of seeing. Yeah. So how, well, like, it's hard to say, like, because you don't have that to compare it to, but I guess everyone has their own story and experience. So I guess I'll just start by how, how was your experience uh, growing up? It was pretty normal up until probably like kindergarten because, you know, you're kind of self-absorbed as a little kid. You're hanging out with your family. So nobody like I kind of just did whatever my brother and my cousins were doing. Nobody really said that I couldn't. And then Mm -hmm. when I started school, I guess was around the time that other kids started treating me differently. And then I started noticing that adults were doing it, too. So like other kids would come up to me and be like, oh, how many fingers am I holding up? Stuff like that. So I'd be like, I'd just give them the middle finger and be like, oh, how many fingers am I holding up? Would you actually? Yeah. <laughs> so you didn't start to realize that things were different for you compared to everyone else until like grade school? Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Um, and at that point, what was what was the thinking that was taking hold of you? Like, oh, I'm different than everyone else and that's a bad thing? Yeah, I think because the first time I really noticed it, I was playing on the playground with this kid that was a couple of years older than me. Mm-hmm. And we were just the only two kids on the playground that day. And we were playing, having a good time. And he asked me why I didn't look at anything. And mm-hmm. I didn't really think anything of it at the time. I just said, I'm blind, like, you know, kind of, oh, I have brown hair and blue eyes, same, same sort of thing. And his reaction was so sudden and so violent he shoved me backwards off the slide and ran away and got on his bike and pedaled away while he (laughs) yelled insults about me being blind um so that was like really the first kind of dramatic moment i guess that i realized that i was different and i remember laying there on the playground as he left and thinking like you know all these little things kind of clicked into into place and I was like wow I am different and different's not a good thing so I'm gonna try and hide it that almost seems like a scene out of like a movie and they like they like try to make the bully to be out such a bad person you're like that never happens like there's no way that they're that bad but wow that's uh that's wild how do you so what do you I mean specifically about that situation what did at the time of course you thought wow I'm different and this person reacted in that way But uh, I mean, what were your thoughts over time of that situation? I think of that situation in particular, you know, looking back on it as an adult, I have to wonder where that kid learned it from because, you know, he got it from somewhere. And, you know, clearly he was raised to, I guess, fear difference. Mm. Yeah. And then he just reacted in some some sort of negative way because he just, I don't know, either was supposed to fear it because he learned that or just was confused and that was just how he ended up reacting i suppose 
Yeah, yeah, I think, you know, fear gets so closely tied into anger. So sometimes when we're afraid of something, we react with anger or aggression. And I think that's probably what was going on there. Mm -hmm. And that's honestly one of the main things I wanted to talk about today. I've been thinking about a lot lately is courage. And courage is, I think, by definition, the facing fear to do something that you feel is right or should be done. Mm -hmm. But the whole point of courage is that you need that first part is mm -hmm. the fear. Yeah. And, you know, there's people walking around today, you know, some of them are very successful, like CEOs, some of them are, you know, uh, the, the homeless or whatever, but they're, you know, like almost psychopathic, they don't feel the fear. And that's not necessarily a good or admirable thing. It's feeling that and then doing what you feel is best in that situation, regardless of what could happen to you or wh what the consequences might be. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's cool. Um, <laughs> but I guess we should talk about what you've, how you've come through all that. So you started to realize at that point that you are different mm -hmm. and that you're starting to realize it's almost a bad thing. Yeah. So what's the next step? What was the next step in the story here? I think the next step was, you know, I was really trying to for a couple of years there because, you know, I think that happened when I was five. So you don't really. Um, so I would try to hide it. And, you know, if anybody ever asked me about it, I never answered that question again. Why don't you look at anything like I would just try to avoid that question. And I had like a really good, solid core group of friends, but there definitely were, you know, issues with with kids growing up and it you know, it kind of, I guess, affects your, you don't feel worthy, maybe. Mm. You don't feel worthy of like having the friends that you have or just having any of the things that you do, or you just don't feel worthy in general. You just don't feel like, I don't know, I guess you don't feel like you matter. And yeah, sometimes mm -hmm. I think even with like having the friends that I had, you know, we would go to an amusement park or something like that. And inevitably, as we got older, one of them would kind of have to stay behind with me and be my guide because I couldn't navigate all the stairs and obstacles mm -hmm. and things as fast as everybody else could. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was really aware of that growing up. Mm -hmm. I think in a way it was a blessing and in a way it was a curse to be so self-aware so young because it just makes you question everything like why are these people even bothering to hang out with me kind of thing mm -hmm. and you almost feel like uh not only that you can't like contribute to the group but almost like a nuisance at that point i yeah, suppose totally mm -hmm. dang so you you feel like you're almost dragging your friends down at that point yeah um so and while i feel like that might be something that everyone can relate to to some extent i don't know you know about fully but i think i think everyone kind of has that kind of a feeling with something whether it's as major as that or maybe something crazier or or less so um and i think it's important and that's part of why a lot of people are entering therapy now and things like that is to discover what that is that makes them feel that way and then you know hopefully overcome it um so you started to feel like a nuisance at this point um after feeling different and realizing that that might be a bad thing mm -hmm. um so what's the next step now now you are entering you know a period of life that a lot of people find difficult you know like adolescence yes how are you start uh gripping with things at that point so i think anxiety really started for me probably around seven and at the time, I think, I hope it's changing. I'm not really sure. But at the time when I was growing up, it was like, you know, they would take me to the pediatrician because I would be sent home from school sick all the time because I would be so anxious. Mm. And the pediatrician is kind of like, well, she's just anxious. She'll grow out of it. It's fine. Which is really unfortunate because, you know, when you're a kid, that's the, the best chance that they have to intervene and kind of stop those patterns before they become so ingrained. So by early adolescence, I think the anxiety had kind of led to the depression that followed because, you know, nobody wants to feel like that all the time. You feel sick all the time. 
you question everything and so it just kind of gets to the point where you're like well i don't want to do this anymore mm -hmm. so you you i mean you were almost having signs being sent out to everybody like look things aren't going good for me i'm being very anxious and it's causing me a physical illness which is a real thing it's somato uh well, so I don't know, somatosensory, and it like actually causes physical feelings of pain and uh, from the anxiety and such. Mm -hmm. um, so you were sending out these signals and it, it seemed like nobody was reading them. Did, is that how you felt like that? Oh, no one's uh, seeing what I'm what I'm feeling. And yeah, I think so. So I think I would just, you know, I got to the point where I tried to, you know, play my cards really close and mm -hmm. just not even show that to people because again I think you know people kind of react like oh you're just being a nuisance again mm -hmm. you know you're overreacting whatever it might be so you try and just you know hide that which is really unfortunate by the time it gets to depression because then you start to hide that as well did you feel like you had somebody to confide in or tell these things to not really no it, it kind of felt like nobody really fully got it you know it was kind mm. of always this thing of oh you'll grow out of it it'll be fine when mm. you get older i feel like the main problems i run into when i'm trying to look for help or advice from somebody is they either do the that thing like oh you maybe you'll grow out of whatever difficulty you're experiencing or which is even more frustrating in my opinion is the sympathy but no like empathy like you know they oh wow you know it must be really tough being blind like i can't imagine it's so hard you know and then it, it's just period that's it you know yeah. like oh that sucks you know and some, sometimes that's good to hear it's like okay you this person really you know understands me or whatever um but it's like okay now help let's let's work through this you know let's let's find then some actionable steps where we work through this you know yeah there's nothing actionable there mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So, okay. So now things are starting to get um, pretty bleak. It may be in your own head. You f you feeling like what? You can't reach out to anyone to have a real conversation with. You are feeling like a nuisance with your friends, maybe even your family. And you're starting to get into a depression at this state. Yes. And how old are you right now at that time? 13. Okay, 13. Yeah. Okay. So what are your next, what, what's going on next? So I was called actually to the school counselor's office because people, I guess somebody had contacted her and was concerned about my safety. So I started meeting with her and a psychologist outside of school and a social worker. And that kind of went on for a couple of years. And then you know, I kind of got to the point where I'm like, oh, I don't really need this anymore. I'm fine. And I was for a couple of years, but, you know, like major depressive episodes, they come and they go. So you think, oh, I've beaten this. And then a couple of months later, a year later, or whatever, you're, you're back in the midst of that spiral again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's one thing I see in myself as well as, you know, a lot of other people and seeing depressed patients when I'm in the hospital is it's always a roller coaster, right? I mean, you're going to go through highs and lows and this sounds kind of corny, but it, it's true. You go through the highs and lows and you, no matter how good you feel or how much you feel like you've understand things now compared to when you did before, things are going to confuse you again. Things, the waters will become muddled and you're going to have to go through another time of trying to understand things and go through your past and things like that. So, um, yeah, just I guess the the lesson there, if there's if there's one to be learned, is it you never have it all figured out, you know. That no. there's no finish line. There's no finish line. That's no. the bottom line. But that's that's a tough thing for uh, you know a 13 year old who's trying to come to grips with being completely different than everyone around them, right? I, yeah. I, I can imagine anyway. Yeah. No, for sure. And there were some, you know troubles at home with family and things like that so it just really all culminated in this one depressive disaster tell them tell them more about um your family life at that point so what kind of problems were you running to then i know i know you were feeling like a nuisance at some points you know oh why even go to this event when you know i'm just going to be holding people back and such 
Yeah, so my family, my dad was diagnosed with cancer when I was three, and then he was kind of in and out of remission for a couple of years. He left when I was six for the first time, and then came back and left again when I was 13 for the final time, and then he got really sick again right after he left, so, and I wasn't, we didn't really have a relationship, and then I'm finding out that he's sick again, and you know, in the weird way of a teenager, you're kind of self-absorbed and you're almost thinking, well, maybe this is my fault. Mm. Yeah, 100%. One thing that I think this day and age that we run into is, is the difference between what should I take responsibility for and what shouldn't I? So like, you know, I think that's a pretty uh, prime and maybe obvious example in hindsight of, oh, I, maybe I shouldn't take responsibility for this, right? Maybe it was the circumstances that played into this. Yes. But then, you know, so many people are running into the victim mentality where it's, look, the system is bogging me down. It's making me feel this way. It's making me do that. My parents did this to me. And so I'm, I'm ruined, right? Yeah. Um, but, you which know, helps no one. <laughs> which helps nobody, right? But there is something important to understanding about when, when something is circumstantial or when something that you can take responsibility for and act on, you know? Yes. Um, so at this point, were you, were you, I mean, you were pretty young, but were, would you be able to understand that kind of a, a concept? I mean, you, I know you had been going through something like that in early age makes you, I, I feel maybe extra aware of everything around you compared to the average person. Yeah. Were you, were you starting to think about these things yet or did that come, come later on? Uh, you mean like when he was like that? Yeah. So like taking the responsibility on. for that. Um, I mean, you took responsibility for his sickness to some extent. You're like, oh, this how, some way isn't my fault. Like, at what point did you start to maybe, you know, work around that and figure out that maybe, maybe that's not the case? Probably mm, the end of high school to the first couple of years of university. Mm. So, what were the what were the events that led up to that? Um. I think just like you said, getting more self-awareness of, okay, this, this is something I can control. This is something I can't control and really putting those things into two different categories, kind of, okay, I can do something about this. I can't do something about this. This was caused by me. This wasn't caused by me. Mm -hmm. So in general, what do you think are some misconceptions about people who are blind that that people have i think a big one is that we are i don't know how to put this nicer but that we're stupid so hmm. you know i'll go out to a restaurant and for example and the waitress will either not talk to me at all so she'll talk to whoever i'm with oh what does she want to eat or she'll talk to me like i'm like three years old you know with the whole like baby voice and everything mm, which is really that's so demeaning oh, yes man. yes it is and it almost makes me want to like start talking <laughs> back with that same voice and like maybe then they'll get it that it's <laughs> ridiculous uh, one thing that uh, I can I've seen around. So I'm from an international medical school, and we, you know, we have people from all over the place who go there. You know, whatever uh, Africa, Asia, the Americas, everywhere. So, and it's in the Caribbean, and we see so many people who speak many different languages and stuff. And I've seen a similar thing with that. So someone who you know, like half knows a language, every like the first your first instinct is to be like oh he's not smart she's not smart mm -hmm. like and it, it's hard because that is genuinely your first instinct whether you like it or not no matter how good of a person you are i think that's it's pretty universal yeah. but then you you just you have to think past that and and just you know reconcile the fact that hey if i only knew half a language I might seem stupid, but I'm not, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because you're going to sound like, you know, a bit of a toddler when you're mm -hmm. speaking a language you don't, you don't speak, but that doesn't mean that you're not very proficient and intelligent in your own language. Mm -hmm. And so in those earlier years, were you able to forgive um, the people who, like, treated you that way, you, such as the waiter who would come by and treat you like, you know, with the baby voice? Were you able to, like forgive them yet for that that would be pretty tough for somebody at a young age i feel yeah it was hard it just felt like 
you know, I try to educate as many people as I could and it was never enough. There was always, you know, another waiter that was going to do the same thing or mm. whatever. So it just felt like I can't fix this. Like I'm in a situation that I can't wake up for like on the really bad days. Like this is a nightmare. I can't wake up from this. I can't make people stop treating me like this because even if I get through to one person, it's going to be like how many more are there to educate it's never ending and i can't fix it right and you're not exactly going to wear a shirt that says hey i'm blind and then there's like a paragraph about <laughs> you know hey like i understand just as much as you and yeah. like this and that you know and, and then it's just almost seems like oh this person just wants attention because they're blind totally yeah yeah <laughs> it's like you're damned if you do and damned if you don't i, yeah. don't know. I still haven't figured out <laughs> the magic bullet to educating people without yeah, being over the top. Like. Yeah. Well, I think there's a lesson in there somewhere. I mean, you you want to educate people on, on, on difficult topics, but you can't like force it uh, on the people who either aren't willing to listen or just aren't important to the conversation in the first place. Like that person walking by on the street and, you know, they might give you a funny look or, you know, say a certain thing, but do they really matter in the, in the context of everything? Like, does it really matter? You know, the, what yeah. they say? Yeah, and I think that's the point that you have to get to, or you'll just drive yourself crazy. <laughs> yeah, and that, I mean, I think that's the thing with, that I imagine with great adversity such as this is, you either become stronger because of it, or it defeats you, right? Yes. And so tell us about the time when you started to feel defeated by this. I think it was on and off for a lot of years with my major depressive episodes you know it would all kind of coincide to oh my god i can't fix this this will never change so you know you have that like hopelessness going on and especially when i was in one of my episodes which you know could range anywhere from a couple weeks to a couple months or even up to a year where you know i'd stop eating i'd stop sleeping my hair would start falling out all that kind of thing <laughs> Your hair would generally start falling out. Yeah. Dang. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So you started to have these types of feelings and what were you doing at the time uh, at this point? Like what was your like day to day? I was in university. Then I got out of university. I traveled. I went to live abroad for a year and that was actually probably the best year, you know, the least there were no depressive episodes. It was what caused like you more what familiar. caused you to to travel? Like what what transpired? What were you thinking? Well, I grew up kind of surrounded by the the Latin American community in Canada. And to make like a really big generalization here, Canadians tend to have like one of two responses to my blindness. <laughs> okay. Either they like get super awkward about it and you know, to the point where like they don't even well, some people get really awkward about it and that's all they want to talk about. Some people get so uncomfortable with it that you can tell that they're like studiously avoiding the topic, which is mm -hmm. awkward too. Mm -hmm. And some people try to pretend that they're totally cool with it by like cracking jokes and things like that, which mm -hmm. is cool. I like a good blind joke as much as the next person. <laughs> but I've heard them all like yeah. people are a lot less original than they think. So they'll like crack these jokes and I'll just be like, ah. Oh. <laughs> but Damn. on the on the other side i think people from latin america and i don't really know why but they're they're a lot more observant so they ask a lot a lot fewer questions but they mm. observe a lot more and they just don't get weird about things i don't <laughs> know what it is but so having grown up like kind of surrounded by that i wanted to go to a country and and be completely immersed in it you know to go to this place and be different for a different reason so mm. to be like the girl from canada instead mm. of always the blind girl right go over there and be the white girl from canada yeah, <laughs> like yeah, oh look exactly. at this girl yeah <laughs> yeah that's cool that's an interesting take on it um yeah i think that's a, a decent thing for people to appreciate although it's another one of those that um it's hard to to get into people's heads unless they are really trying to like change something is the maybe listen and observe things before you know you start taking action or saying things about something right um yeah but 
but there's also the other side of it too, which is it's important to start taking action on something before, you know, before you just keep thinking about it, keep thinking about it, keep thinking about it. And then you never take action. You could have, for instance, you could have easily never traveled or taken that chance. Um, but you're like, I'm going to take this action, even though it's scary. Yeah, totally. So you go to Latin America, which country again? Peru. Peru. Okay. And you had a great experience there. You, people were more, I guess, just understanding and, and just in, in that context. Yes. Okay. And then you come back and do you have troubles again? Are you, is it, is it, is it bad again? Yeah. So at the airport, getting off the plane, the very first conversation I had was with this guy. Well, I didn't even have the conversation with him because he wouldn't talk to me directly. He was talking to my partner who was with me Hmm. and he goes, what's wrong with her? Was she born that way? Oh and, my god! And this is like Come the on, first interaction I've had with anybody in Canada for the past year. And it like something like that didn't happen to me even once when I was in Peru. Whereas like here, it's almost a daily occurrence. So it was oh just man, like, is it really? Yeah, it, it happens a lot. So uh, it was like, like this, I'm been back in Canada for five minutes and I remember exactly why I wanted to leave in the first place. That surprises me. I, I, I didn't think that it would be an everyday thing in the US, but that's crazy. Yeah, why, do you have, you have no idea? I mean, I'm sure you've thought about it. What, why is it just a cultural thing? Is it because you had something else that stood out um, besides besides that and in, in South America or, or what was what are, you, what are your thoughts on it? I think it almost might be like the the culture of us in North America is we almost feel entitled to information. Mm. So we want to know something, we're going to find it out. We don't care how we do that. We mm. just want to know. Huh. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Um, and there's something kind of cool about that where it's like, look, the end is very important here Mm -hmm. and and it is but maybe there's a better way to go about it (laughs) yeah yeah i mean knowledge is power but yeah and something's like the grocery store to ask like oh what's it like to be blind i don't know what's it like to be sighted like (laughs) yeah and and some things are okay to not know you know like if someone's got like a mark on the side of their head or something like yeah maybe it's a good conversation starter but also maybe just keep doing your thing (laughs) like maybe you don't need to probably been asked about that 10 times already today and they don't need to be asked (laughs) right 100 percent. okay so (laughs) you have this bad conversation with this guy and i'm sure it's not the only experience you've had with that no um and so you go back onto the roller coaster when you kind of come back although i'm sure you were still on it somewhat um when you were in peru yeah yeah to a certain extent it was definitely better but yeah it was still there Mm -hmm. and i want to get back to travel again later but what i mean what's the next step here i mean you (laughs) at some point you go all the way down deep end right let's let's get to that yeah so i come back from peru we move around a little bit we settle in a really small town there was no trans like public transportation or anything so i really lost a lot of independence and it was hard to find a job so things just were you know my self-worth was kind of non-existent at that point and of course i entered into a major depressive episode in i guess november of 2018 and that one didn't really end like the others had um Mm -hmm. it just kind of went on and on and on and it got to the point i think in june of 2019 i set up an emergency appointment with one of my doctors and they they were able to keep me out of the hospital that time. They um, adjusted my medication, made sure that I was getting more outpatient mental health supports and things like that. So it was definitely helping. Things were improving. And then in March of 2020, <laughs> we all know what happened then. Mm-hmm. And I think I wasn't far enough into recovery. So my doctors... Mm-hmm stop seeing patients in person we didn't have even video calls back then it was just like these phone conversations so they didn't really see like the physical 
um, signs of what was going on. They were harder to reach. Mm. My therapists were harder to reach. Um, appointments with psychiatrists were like everything was so backed up and so delayed. And it just got to the point where, yeah, I couldn't cope anymore. And I felt completely out of control. And the one thing I realized that I could control is how and when I would die. Wow. So you go through all this. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Sorry, that's heavy. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, things, things took a little bit of a turn. <laughs> So, okay. What, before, before we continue on, what was helping you with, you were taking the medication, you were taking, mm -hmm. you were taking the visits with the, the in-person before this, right? Yes. Then they switched to tele, to televisits. Mm -hmm. First talk about that. It, it just, was it less personable? Was it, they just couldn't see as many signs? What, what, what was going on? What do you think fell there? I think it was just such a hard time for everybody. Nobody knew what was going on. And I think it was really challenging for people in the medical community. Um, so, you know, it was harder to make doctor's appointments. They would call, but they would, you know, kind of be distracted and because they're mm. trying to manage all this other stuff and not seeing people in person. Like it was a huge shift, I think, for everybody. So mm. I think that they were a little less attentive maybe and there just wasn't that that personal like oh i can see the physical signs that you're struggling mm -hmm. and it's not exactly i mean it's it's a combination of things i mean yes. we, we can imagine it's uh first of all just extra stress on the medical system and then a complete change in how things are done i mean it's completely on camera now um i mean among other things so okay so things definitely fell there um was there anything else i mean you so you were staying at home um you couldn't really go anywhere and that all had a toll on you as well yeah i think a big thing for me was when i would go through these major depressive episodes i would make these like survival goals like I can't kill myself until I take one last trip to visit my friends in Mexico, sure. or I can't kill myself until my friend comes to visit or whatever it was, or mm. until I finish this recording project that I'm working on to make a new album, whatever it was, mm. and all of those things. So I would like kind of obsessively count down to when these things would happen so that I <laughs> could keep going. Then COVID comes. And I don't know when any of that's going to happen. So mm. all of a sudden there's, there's like no incentive. So one thing that I can draw a comparison to, and I think that's all a lot of us can really do to understand each other with some things is to a much smaller extent, of course, when I'm on a run, right? Mm -hmm. Let's say I'm, this is one of the longest runs I've done and I'm dying by the end of this run, right? I'm like, oh, unless I'm only like halfway, I'm thinking, okay, fine, you can quit early. You can quit early, it's okay, like I'll forgive you, but you have to go until this point. Yes. And so I would do it, you know, I would like, okay, fine, you know, just one step, another step, another step, I'm, I'm dying. And then, I, you know, all right, I'm getting close to that point. I'm, I just counting down, I'm like, God, can I just get there, please? And then I get there, right? Oh, I hit the stop sign, okay, well, okay. I, I'm going to just do everything I can to just go a little more. I know I'm not going to make it, but I'm going to go a little bit more. So I do. And then I, I keep going a little bit more. And then I, I am like, you know what? It's crazy. I couldn't believe it before, but I might, I might just be able to make it. And then I, you know, I finish my run and that's like almost a daily occurrence. Like, mm -hmm. and it's on a much smaller extent, but I see, I can kind of see how that thinking is, is similar. Yeah, um, yeah, that's a perfect analogy, I think. Okay, so you are just counting down these days, like, all right, I owe it to this person to see them one more time. I, I maybe I just experienced this one last thing, you know, before I call it. Yeah. So that's what you're thinking at this point. COVID yes. hits, and you're unable to do a lot of these things. Yeah. Um, which a lot of us have been unable to do our normal events and. Totally that's tough too. Um, 
<laughs> it's it's just so hard to draw these comparisons between these like you know because like uh, the thing you know i'm thinking of an example of like oh a person couldn't like go to the grocery store that they like very much anymore at the hours they wanted and that yeah. can deeply affect somebody you know like that was their thing every day and it kind of made them feel good you know or whatever the case is yeah. and you know but for you you <laughs> you couldn't do these things that were like just keeping you alive essentially yeah yeah <laughs> Wow. Um, okay. So you're going through this. What, what's the next, what's the next step? So you're going through all this. What, I mean, did, what, what's, where did, how did we keep going down? How did, how far did we keep going down? Yeah. So basically it got to the point where I was, you know, still breathing, but I, I, it's hard to explain if you haven't mm. been there, but you're just like practically comatose. Like you're just not functioning at all. So <laughs> Finally, I decided, no, like, this is stupid. I'm not going to do this anymore. So, you know, I got my affairs in order, made firm plans for how and where and when. And But before that, I was like, you know what? I made this safety plan with my, my uh, therapist back when I started seeing him. Mm. And the last step, like I had to sign it and everything. The last step really? was when all else fails, go to the hospital. So it would, there were like these, like a column with signs that I was spiraling, then what to do about them from, you know, least invasive to most invasive. And the mm. last thing on that list was go to the hospital. Mm. And so I thought, you know what, I'll, I'll go. And I'm not I don't have any interest in getting better. I'm just going to go for absolution because I'm going to go there. They're going to be like, okay, you're fine. Go home. Mm. And then once I'm gone, my family and my loved ones can look at that and be like, well, she tried. Mm. You're like, oh, I did all the steps. I did what yeah. I could. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So, okay. So you go to the hospital. So you, what'd you tell you told your, you told your mom and then you went to the hospital or how did that go? Yeah, I told my partner. I okay. he was like really relieved by mm. that point because it's it's so hopeless and helpless when you're watching somebody struggle like that mm. too. Because what do you really do about it? And I think there's this misconception that I don't know how it works there. I guess in every state it's different, but there's this misconception that your family members can have you locked up just because. It doesn't work that way. Yeah, well, that's okay. So, yeah, so like they can't, when you're an adult, they can't just drive, like mm. put you in the car and force you to go. Right, right. I, okay. So, you know, like a, a paramedics or the police or whatever would have to be involved. And then once you get to the hospital, it has to be a physician that makes that call. A family mm. member can't do it. So I think a lot of people were like, oh, I didn't, your family do more intervene because, yeah yeah like it's so easy to say that in hindsight mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. looking at it from the outside but there's a lot less i think that people can do than than mm -hmm. they realize maybe against someone's will mm -hmm. yeah it's easy to like see a movie or something about this yeah. and be like i would intervene right <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> especially with the the low options you have because yeah essentially it's up to you at the end of the day i mean whether you want to do whatever action Yes. Yeah. And once you get there, they can hold you. So basically mm -hmm. what happened for me is <laughs> things didn't work out as planned. Obviously. <laughs> yeah, obviously. I went there and they decided they were like, no, we're going to admit you as an involuntary patient. Mm -hmm. So yeah, which basically just meant I didn't have the freedom to leave. And, mm -hmm. you know, the, the psych ward was locked and everything. So there was, yeah, nowhere really to go. Mm -hmm. So you're locked in this <laughs> asylum, essentially. Essentially. <laughs> what What are your What are you thinking at this point? So the morning I went, um, they weren't really letting anybody into emergency because of COVID, like any um, family members or anything. But they let my partner go with me so he could escort me, mm. and they took me immediately to. Uh, psychiatric emergency services. I don't, I think every hospital probably calls it something a little bit mm. different, um, which, yeah, I had these locking doors, obviously. So I mm -hmm. 
talk to a crisis nurse then sat around for a bit then the er doctor came and she was the one that did all the paperwork and everything mm. for my admission so jordan my partner was still sitting there through all this so he had to like see what was going on in the mm. emergency psych which was mm. you, know, you know not the it's not the prettiest scene in the world no no it's not at all so finally i get admitted and they say okay you have to leave and so he stands up and he goes through this door and it's this huge heavy locking metal door with, yeah and so the door like slams behind him and it's you get like the electronic oh my like, God. noise of the lock going like going home or whatever and i remember just sitting there and thinking like this is the end of the road like no matter mm. what happens from here like this is it and uh, again i can only imagine but there can't be anything more alienating than being locked away from everyone else like uh, you're so different that we have to like put you into here yeah yeah and it's covid so there's no visitors for the entire time you're there <laughs> that can't help no because <laughs> no. like you want somebody to <laughs> You, know, you want to see somebody in that visitor's chair next to your hospital bed sometimes and there's just nobody you're going through it you know essentially alone they let me keep my cell phone which was nice because so how long how long are you in the in this area then because this is the er yeah so i spent three days in the psych er and mm. then got moved to uh this they call it pez or no, sorry, the IPU, PEZ is Psych Emergency Services, mm. which is inpatient psychiatric unit. And then mm. I was there for another, about another week. Okay. And during this time, um, you wake up each day, you, I'm assuming, take your medications that they give you. Yeah. Um, and, you know, eat, were you eating your food? Were you, were you just doing your normal activities or how, how was that all going? Well, I, I was admitted not eating at all. Like mm. I've gotten to the point where I couldn't eat solid food anymore. Mm. And so I was like, when they weighed me, I was 30 pounds less than what I would have guessed my wow. lowest guess would have been. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. So initially there was like a lot of nutritional therapy and like really small, really frequent meals. Yeah. We see in the ER and well, in other areas too, but people who come in who are very, very old, right. Um, and yeah. have like chronic illnesses and stuff. And we start to see that they're kind of like wasting away, not eating solid food and stuff, but how old are you at this point? <laughs> yeah, no, I'm <laughs> <laughs> no, like this was just last year. So. Yeah, so... <laughs> so That's no, crazy. Like was, yeah, That's I was crazy. doing it to myself. Yeah. Wow. Um, okay. So you start to eat food after what, a week or so? Or how, how, how was that going? A couple of days. It was actually like really okay. surprising to me how quickly I could eat because it was almost <laughs> like this, like I got locked away and I was really unhappy about it, obviously, and mm -hmm. scared and stuff. But there was also this kind of like relief of like, mm -hmm. okay, the decision's been made for me. I won't die today. So I can just, I can relax a little bit. Mm -hmm. You're like, you don't even have the choice in the matter for that anymore. So you may as well relax at this point. Exactly. Yeah. I'll figure it out later. But, you know, for today, the choice has been made for me. <laughs> That's wild. Yeah. Um, again, the the smallest, you know, connection here ever. But I think I think it might be there is, you know, OK, I'm going out to this like party or something. And I'm very anxious, right? I'm very anxious about going to it. There's gonna be people there that I know, but not everybody. And you know, I'm just I'm worried, you know, and uh, am I gonna go? Am I not gonna go? I decided I'm gonna go. I told people I'm gonna go. But at the last second, I'm like, yeah, maybe I'm not, you know, I just I'm not cut out for this. I just I got other things to do a million excuses to go through your head. And then you know, oh, uh, sorry, the party's canceled, you know, yes. then relief. Oh. Yes, totally. Okay. Oh, is, okay. Yeah. yeah. No, or like a perfect example. Or even the other way. Oh, the party's at your house now. And it's right here, right now. You know, it's like, I don't have an option. It's in my place. I can't escape. Yeah. I may as well just accept this party. And I'm, I'm going to start talking to people, you know, I guess either way. Yeah, totally. Um, okay. So yeah, I'm just trying to like make some connections because otherwise, you know, it's, it's easy. It's easy for people to be like, Oh, this person went through this wild experience and 
you can't either can't relate to it yeah because i've never been to a psych unit you know i've never had to be locked in somewhere like i I just uh, never happened right and then you just go wow that's that's a courageous thing that person did or that's a wild thing that person went through but you know i think there's there's some connections you could draw draw to things in your daily life um yeah totally like that relatability because it is like if you haven't gone through it 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 does sound crazy and you know you explain these things to people and they're like well that there's no logic to that Mm. yeah because i mean i've never i've truly never felt like a comatose state where i just don't want to of course i've had lazy days right but i've never felt like i just don't want to eat all day and nothing like nothing matters except maybe doing that last thing before i like kill myself like i've definitely never experienced that so yeah maybe this is the way we can try to like relate through it right yeah absolutely so you've been there about a week or so you've been eating food again you have felt some relief because you no longer have that decision to make anymore you may as well just do your thing live in this moment now what so the first couple days was really like just kind of doing whatever they wanted but like i didn't Mm. really care i was just biding my time right like Mm. okay one of these days they're gonna have to let me out of here and then i can continue on um but i guess it was yeah almost a week into it and i was lying awake one night i couldn't sleep they were you know i i think in the (laughs) when they adjust your psych meds out of the psych ward they do it a little bit more gently when you're in the psych ward it's Mm. like well you're here so we're just gonna like pull out all the stops and yeah it's gonna suck for you but you're here so (laughs) so, oh well (laughs) a hundred percent i've a hundred percent seen that and they're like well look we can take care of this person you know if they go through some drastic change like okay well they're right here they have the best medical attention possible (laughs) so let's go for it let's like run them through the wall you know let's see if we can break through yeah yeah Yeah, wow so So that must have been some interesting experiences the side effects were insane it was it was awful so i couldn't sleep that was one of them i was almost like in this kind of weird euphoric state just because of all the med changes Mm. that they've been doing very drastically Mm. and the um, medevac helicopter comes and it lands and right afterwards they call a code blue and okay so i'm laying there and i start thinking about this patient and like, who can't God, breathe they're, yeah their poor family like they're having one of the scariest nights of their lives mm-hmm. and i'm like wait a second how can i feel so much empathy for their family but i know the decision i want to make is going to devastate my own family and then i started thinking about the patient themselves and there was just this crazy juxtaposition of okay they're here fighting to live i'm here fighting to die i have a choice in the matter they might not and it was like this moment where like okay i have to choose now i mean they're going to become an active participant in my treatment plan and get better or get well enough to get out of the hospital so i can tell my story so i can use this as you know something bigger than what it was so my life wasn't just you know this wasted tragedy kind of thing you know turn something really awful into hopefully something good to help other people who are going through it and educate people who haven't gone through it were you having all of those thoughts at at that time or was that something that you started to generate wow okay yeah yeah it was like this moment of wow clarity i guess was it all that evening with that um helipad with the code blue with all of that you 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 it really hit home huh yeah and things definitely got worse before they got better after Mm -hmm. that because all of a sudden you're actually trying and (laughs) and stuff starts to hurt yeah right stuff gets really hard because all of a sudden you care so (sighs) Yeah, it wasn't like this magical, like, oh, everything is better now and is all solved. All right. of a sudden, it's like there's so much grief and trauma and things that you're actually trying to process because you actually want to get better. 
you don't, yeah, you don't just have the moment of clarity and then everything no. is easier. You have the moment of no. clarity and then you start to work toward things being better. And it's like the worst pain of yes. your life. Yeah. And you can't be, you're like the 300 pound guy who decides, oh, you know what? I'm going to lose weight and I'm going to run a marathon one day. You don't just, you know, like that first run feels yeah. horrible. <laughs> yeah. You don't start with the marathon. <laughs> no, no, you definitely don't. You definitely don't. Okay. Wow. But you, I mean, here's the thing though, you, you kind of decided at that point, you wanted to like run the marathon. Like you weren't just, I'm going to come out of this and be like good enough each day and like, enjoy my life. You were like, I'm going to be an active participant in my care and hopefully, and, and like, and I want to genuinely like create a better experience for other people by like sharing my story and things like that. Yes. I mean, that's the marathon. You you decided at that point, I am going to run the marathon. And I think that's kind of how it is too with the fat guy. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. like he decides, like, you know, I'm going to do this big goal. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, and then it's, that, it's you got to take one step at a time. Yeah, yeah, it totally is. It's tiny, tiny, tiny steps towards hopefully something better. Mm -hmm. So what were, your, what were your first steps? My first steps were... Well, <laughs> the next day, actually, in group, um, why do they have group therapy and so forth? It's, it's like a really terrible. I mean, I get what you don't like it. it but <laughs> like, I get that it's yeah. you know expedient or whatever because then they're you know you have your private therapy every day with the um, with the psychiatrist, and then you have your little sessions that they kind of break up throughout the day with the psych nurses. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, they. <laughs> Group therapy. Um, <laughs> it's not kinda... for you. <laughs> is, is, it, is it for anybody? Do you think it's even effective? I I think maybe if the group's more targeted, but in the hospital, they just mm. kind of throw everybody together. So you have like the really confused patients together with the people. Like, yeah, you know, it's like a strange mixed about, bag. Yeah, like how they want to kill different people and stuff like that. Yeah. And then you have like the depressed <laughs> patients and everything else. So it's just like this weird, like, I don't know how they possibly manage it so that every person in that group can get something out of it because there's just way too diverse and array yeah. needs a guy just yeah. talked about wanting to like commit homicides and then you're like all right let's transition into that i like feel depressed you know <laughs> like, yeah, it's just... yeah exactly or like you know there was this this guy talking about like really really awful things and then they all okay okay now we're gonna practice meditation <laughs> <laughs> it's like that's almost comical seriously yeah like it was so ridiculous so he actually sent, said something that brought up a lot of trauma for me oh really it was clearly unresolved so mm. i went back to my room i had a major panic attack um the facilitator for the group actually came in to check on me she couldn't make any progress with me so mm. she went and got my regular psych nurse mm. and basically we we couldn't get anywhere so they decided the best course of action was just to sedate me and try again wow the next day. So, wow yeah so it was like this yeah, yeah you had really the did get worse before. you had the moment of clarity and then those steps were whole, awful like yeah. i mean that, that sounds so painful i mean you, okay they were just, just straight up all right well we'll sedate her and we'll try again another day yeah yeah exactly like it just it was almost like the most humane thing to do mm. do you so do you remember at that time what you were feeling or what you're like saying and what you're experiencing i don't think i was really saying anything i just i think i was just i don't know like there was just so much grief of like how did it come to this this mm. is not you know i i think i remember like my last thought before I was completely sedated, just being like, my life wasn't supposed to go this way. Dang. So you try, so, okay. So you're st starting to take those first steps. They turn out pretty rough. You, they sedate you. What's the next step? The next step is <laughs> to try again the next day mm -hmm. and things did start to get a little bit easier every day i started you know like i said in the that night that moment of clarity that i was going to be an active participant in in my treatment plan so i would like do research on the stuff that 
I would talk about with a psychiatrist and and just really try and be an active participant in mm -hmm. in in my own improvement because I think like there's the best psychologist in the world can't fix you if you don't want it. A hundred percent. If you don't want to learn how to fish, it's going to be really difficult to, to start being a fisherman, you know? Yeah, exactly. And I think a lot, well, you see patients in there who expect to be fixed by, by the staff and they're, they're the ones that don't really make any progress because they don't see that they have to do the work. There's just mm -hmm. people there who can guide them to do the work and to keep them safe until they're able to keep themselves safe. Mm -hmm. And I like what you said, you were like, when it comes to the work, you, you take like the small steps every day. And, uh, I haven't really seen the show, but there was this one scene in it that I, that I always come back to, uh, I think it's called like, um, I don't know, but anyway, there's this runner and he goes up to this guy who's laying on the ground. He's just been running all day, but he's just starting his like marathon journey. Almost like that guy we were talking about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the fat guy. <laughs> um and he's like it gets easier and the other guy goes what it gets easier you have to do it every day that's the hard part but it gets easier yeah and yeah i don't know that's the that one just really hit me but yeah so you're you kind of start that thinking all right i just got to do this every day it does get easier and you're starting to experience it somewhat that it does get easier every day yeah yeah and to acknowledge that there will be harder days, you know, right. it's not all right. going to get easier. It's right? not a linear progression. No. Definitely not. No. Not at all. It's one step forward, two steps back sometimes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which man, I mean, it's tough out here. It's not easy. You know, none of this is easy. Even, even with the, a lot of the things that I've been given, I mean, I'm a, a middle-class white male who has all my senses. Like even that is like, you know, what is there to complain about? But it, man, it's, it's not easy for anybody out here. No, no, it's not. And we all have our things, you know, like suffering's not a competition. Right. Cause you know, I think we feel like, oh, somebody suffers more so we can't acknowledge our own suffering. It's not a competition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an important thing to take note of too, <laughs> for sure. Um, okay, so you're taking the next steps. Um, do you? So you get out of this area, and where do you go? So that was actually in the IPU. So I had okay. been moved by that point. Okay. So I got out of the IPU, and then there was just like a lot of um, outpatient, like daily outpatient, like check-ins and everything. They would mm. call me and be like, "Okay, what are you eating?" <laughs> like, oh, okay like very like very specific and detailed yeah like i felt like a bit of, like kind of like a five-year-old like, mm. have you been eating all your veggies <laughs> oh man <laughs> or like you know and and just like really intensive like outpatient therapy continuing on with with the skills that they were teaching in the hospital because as you say you have to practice it every day or you lose it and i think mm -hmm. people forget that and they, they're like they learn a new skill like cbt or something cognitive behavioral therapy mm -hmm. or or mindfulness or whatever it is and they're mm -hmm. like okay i'm i'm a master of this now mm -hmm. i learned it it's it's perfect i'm gonna do this and then <laughs> day two it doesn't work mm -hmm. and then they're like well I'm doing everything I can. Why isn't this working? It just doesn't work. I'm going to mm -hmm. give up. But it's literally, it's a, it's a choice that you make every single day. Mm -hmm. It's something you have to practice every day. And the more you do it, the better you get at it. Um, yeah, no, it's yeah. important to keep up every day. And it's something that I struggle with. I think a lot of people do is yeah, understanding and believing, look, I have to do this every day. It's something you practice. Yeah. You practice like meditation, you practice cognitive yes. behavioral therapy. You yeah, know? you don't just like one day wake up and you're like, oh, I'm you don't so just do it. it. Yeah. yeah, no, it's like anything. Like, <laughs> it's like learning an instrument, like a musical instrument or whatever you want to learn or learning mm -hmm. to cook. I don't know, like 100%. So you're starting to learn. Um, you're starting to learn these processes. You're realizing that you have to do them every day and that it is a practice um you're having your ups and downs so you're taking your one step forward and two steps back um your partner is with you you what are you experiencing now um so things were 
really starting to come together and it is always like this kind of scary thing because you're always waiting for the next shoe to drop the other shoe to drop exactly (laughs) like you have so many years of like this conditioning of like okay i'm fine now but i want to start to spiral again (laughs) so for me it was just and it still is it's really a process of taking that pain and turning it into purpose so finding why am I doing this? Why am I getting up every day? What what am I doing to every day to leave the world a little bit better than than I found it? So, you know, mm-hmm. I started to write my book and share things that way with people and do interviews and things like that. And now I'm writing, um, actually recording, we're almost done now, my, my newest album, which is kind of um, almost like a soundtrack for the book. So, okay. Yeah. Oh, congratulations. You're almost done with that, huh? Yeah. Uh, yeah, and check out check out her book, guys. It's called Holding On uh, by Letting Go. And uh, yeah, tell tell people where they can where they can find that, Heather. Yeah, they can find it on Amazon or Audible, uh, Apple Books, Google Play Books, basically wherever you find books. Pretty much anywhere, yeah. On in uh as an ebook, as an audiobook, and in print. Cool. So you start working on these projects. It gives you purpose. It, it will, you're like, I'll hopefully make things better. And that gives me something to live for each day. Um, do you start to feel more gratitude toward the things that you do have? I know you experienced it somewhat, you know, when that code blue happened a while ago, but are you, are you doing it on a daily? Do you have to practice it or does it just come to you now? No, it's definitely, it's, it's gotten easier, but I don't know that it will ever be something that will just happen. I think it's always something that I will need to keep up on, like to use your running analogy, (laughs) like if, if you stop running, you're going to be less fit. So it's Mm. something that you definitely, if you want that fitness or that, you know, mental fitness, I guess you have Mm -hmm. to keep up on it every day, but yeah, no, definitely. It's like there's moments where I just stop and think of everything that's happened since the hospital or even like thinking of the hospital, like if that doctor hadn't wanted to do the paperwork that day or, Mm. you know, if things had worked out just that little bit differently, Mm. if it had been a different doctor, I don't know, you know, then things would have, or if that person hadn't come in with the code blue, even, you know, how Mm -hmm. differently things could have worked out. So I feel really like fortunate that, that timing kind of worked out, I guess, in my favor. Mm-hmm. Or if you didn't take that very last step and go to the hospital. Yeah, that too. Mm-hmm. Dang. But thank you so much uh, for being here. And I wish we could talk a little bit more. But, uh, and I just have a couple more questions and we're more of a, like a, a, a loose, you know, funnier podcast. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> and so I, <laughs> I mean, have you seen like Daredevil or, or, uh, oh you know, God. Or... <laughs> Everyone asks me and, no, I haven't seen it. That movie ruined my life because... <laughs> ever since Daredevil came out, people are like, Oh, do you see better? The right. Yeah. You have I like, you have like was... bats, like yeah, Sonic powers. In there. <laughs> like the dude, what is it? He sees better in the rain or something. I get like, I've never even seen it, but I feel like I kind of know what it's about. Cause... <laughs> yeah um yeah i mean just his other senses have like increased drastically because he can't see right yeah, um, yeah and he's just like a super badass like super strong guy <laughs> yeah essentially yeah that's yeah so that's how you that's what you are right <laughs> totally yeah. yeah everybody always asks me like oh so you must have like super sex like, for everybody like, everything yeah. else like yeah no, I but actually though do you do you i mean it's impossible to know because you've always been blind but do you ever feel the sense that you have like better hearing or better like sense of smell than than the people around you um i don't think it's like better like Mm -hmm. genetically better or anything i think Mm -hmm. it's just more refined yeah okay yeah i suppose that's a better way to put it okay that's cool yeah it's just just curious (laughs) yeah i hate that movie i've never even seen it (laughs) <laughs> oh that's amazing um all right well thank you so much heather uh this has been a really cool experience for me i was kind of nervous at first but <laughs> we kind of <laughs> loosened up a little bit thank you so um, much for having me and yeah the chance to tell my story yes absolutely no problem um 
keep doing uh, what you're doing. Keep sharing your story. Um, I think it in, is really inspiring to a lot of people. And um, again, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much. And good luck with everything. Thank you.